Okay. Uh, first of all, if you haven't, haven't had a chance yet to sign up, could you please, we have a sign-up sheet back there. We just like to keep track of who's actually showing up for these things. Uh, good evening. My name is Mike Hillinger, and I am sitting in for Judy Kola, who is our vice chair. Uh, and she's put a lot of work into organizing this. Unfortunately, she's a bit under the weather tonight. So I've stepped in for her. Uh, it's my privilege this evening to welcome you and introduce our speakers. But first, uh, thanks to the Hanover Conservancy for co-sponsoring this event with us. And our speakers this evening are Roberta Benefield, director of the Grand Riverkeeper uh, Laboratory Incorporated, and Annie Wilson, senior energy policy advisor for the New York Environmental Law Project. Roberta and Annie are on a multi-state tour called Mega Dams, Mega Damage, promoted by an international group of more than 15 environmental and social justice groups. Their purpose is to raise awareness about the negative cultural, environmental, and financial impacts of hydroelectric power generated by, generated by mega dams in Canada. By way of background, subsidized Canadian power companies are targeting new markets in the U.S. Multinational corporations propose a network of transmission corridors in Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and New York to deliver power to hundreds of miles from the remote areas of Canada. The transmission corridors are at various stages of permitting and include the Atlantic Link, New England Clean Energy Connect, Champlain Hudson Power Express, New England Clean Power Link, Vermont Green Line, and of course the Northern Pass through New Hampshire's White Mountains National Forest. State laws and programs classify electric, electricity from these mega dams as, quote, clean and say it helps stop climate change. I'm sure we will hear differently this evening. Over the past several decades, Canada's electricity companies <clears throat> have dammed all but three of the country's largest rivers. This tour focuses on <clears throat> Nalcor Corporation's Muskrat Falls, one of the two proposed impoundment projects in the Grand River, also known as Churchill River. The second proposed dam on the Grand River is called Gull Island, and the Muskrat Falls product, uh, project, also known as Lower Churchill, is currently under construction. So, uh, I look forward to hearing more about this. So with that, I introduce Roberta. Thank you so much. And thank you, what a good turnout. This is, this is fantastic. So glad to see everybody. Um, I was uh, born in Newfoundland, so I, I am generally called a Newfie, but I went to Labrador when I was eight months old, so I am Labradorian by choice, and I lived there all my life all my growing up years. I went away and ended up in Tennessee for about 24 years and then moved back for a visit in 1989. I haven't left since because when I got back to Labrador in 1989, I saw that nothing had changed in Labrador since I left when I was a child. We were still a colonial uh, uh, owned territory. We were run by a colonial offshore government on the island of Newfoundland called St. John's Newfoundland. And basically we had no road. We could, you know, my, my fear when I got back to Labrador and wanted to stay was that during the winter months I could not drive. And as many of you may know, I drove here and I drive everywhere. I drive to see my kids in Tennessee and, and um, Pennsylvania. but. In the winter months when I went back home, I couldn't even drive out of there in the winter. I would have to fly. And I wasn't making very much money. I was a painter and a plasterer at the time. And I thought, what am, you know, can I stay here if something happens to one of my kids? How am I going to get out of here in the dead of winter? I'll have to put some money in the bank so that I can, you know, grab a, a quick uh, Air Canada flight, which, trust me, is not very, not very cheap. So as... Uh, our, uh, uh, the fellow who introduced me, and I'm sorry, where is he? Oh, I can't remember your name. Mike. Thank you, Mike. Um, <coughs> at our age, names kind of skip, escape us. <laughs> so we, uh, we are talking about the Lower Churchill Hydro Project tonight, which is on my river. We call it the Grand River. On the map, it's called the Churchill River. If you take a look over there on these two maps, you can see uh, that Lake Melville flows in from the ocean and it's uh, the river itself from where it empties off the height of land and empties out into the ocean is 530 kilometers long, 530 miles long, sorry, and it's the seventh largest river in Canada. It already has one dam 
The Upper Churchill or the Churchill Falls project was built and put on stream in about 1970-72, depending on which uh, turbine went into power at whichever time. And um, that produces 5,500 megawatts of power, which um, under the infamous 1969 contract, Hydro-Quebec owns pretty much all of it until 2041. So out of that 5,500 megawatts, people had to get in the streets in Happy Valley Goose Bay. We were on diesel at the time. It was while I was in Tennessee, and people had to actually get in the streets and demand power from a project that was like 400 kilometers from us. So this was the kind of thing that I dealt with when I got back in 1989. Still no road. You know, we barely had power. We had to fight for that power. We had to fight for everything. So here we are now with uh, some more projects on the go. The Muskrat Falls project is, uh, is in uh, full swing. And I asked myself, why would it matter to you folks? And basically, these are the reasons why it should matter to you, because each and every one of these proposed power projects is going to bring power from Hydro-Quebec and or Muskrat Falls, and or at any given time, no one would know where it was coming from because you can't, you can't tell where the power is coming from, okay? So those are all reasons why I thought you folks should care. And the, the one power project that got me really riled up was that newest one that uh, Emira uh, brought up, and they had applied for, um, for permission to bring power from from uh, New Brunswick with, with some wind, and our project, Muskrat Falls, and they were going to take it into Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts to replace the, uh, the um, uh, yes, that thing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so that one got me a bit fired up, and I thought, you know, it's about time we go down and talk to the people in the United States, people on the northeastern states, and let them know what happens to the other end of the power cord. Let them know where we are and how we are dealing with this. So also, of course, because there's major issues with this power uh, coming out of Muskrat Falls, there's poison traditional food. Um, with poison food from uh, Inuit and Inu peoples, that affects their culture. It's cultural genocide, basically. And, it, and the poisoning is coming from methyl mercury. I don't know if anybody here is uh, familiar with methyl mercury, but I'll go into it here in a little while. Uh, some lives are probably going to be lost due to flooding uh, because of a natural dam that Nalcor Energy proposes to use as a uh, uh, natural, it's a natural area that's fraught with quick clay that Nalcor proposes to use as a natural dam. It's one of the three dams that would uh, be built on, uh, across the river at Muskrat Falls. There's the loss of habitat and nutrients for scores of wildlife and fish, and in, uh, exactly including Atlantic salmon. And our government's policies are really, really not for the people of Labrador. And we don't have the possibility of voting to, to get good policies for our area because Labrador is about the size of Texas, and we have 27,000 people scattered all over Labrador. On the island of Newfoundland, where the government, really the government seat is, there are about 520,000 people. So it doesn't matter if every man, woman, and child in Labrador votes for something, we're not going to get it. It depends on what the government decides to give uh, to the communities on the island of Newfoundland. We don't, we don't, uh, uh, wish that they wouldn't give anything to those communities, but we certainly would like to get more from them on our area. This is a, a map of all the watersheds sheds in Canada. All of these watersheds in red have already been dammed. They're massive, massive watersheds. This one right here is our watershed. It's 93,000 square kilometers. And it's got already the one upper dam on it, the upper uh, Churchill. So the Labrador Island Link and the Maritime Link, those were the first two things that happened with Muskrat Falls. Uh, this is the Churchill Falls project right here. That's the one that was built in 72. This is Gull Island. That's a narrowing in the river, and it's a drop-off from there, a little drop-off. That proposal right there would go see a dam go up 300 feet. This one right here is Muskrat Falls. 
That one is where we're working right now, and that is about, they claim that is 80% complete, but we don't know for sure because we can't get information about that project because many months and years before the project was at, actually sanctioned, we had a, a premier who was uh, elected with a huge majority, and he went to work and designed some legislation that would stop us from finding out anything about this Muskrat Falls project, and I'll touch on that again in a minute. So this power line called the uh, Labrador Island Link comes down and goes, goes through the Strait of Belle Isle right here with a subsea cable, comes down to Soldier's Pond on, this is where St. John's is, this is the Avalon Peninsula. Then it goes across over here, and it leaves this point and goes down to Cape Breton in Nova Scotia. Uh, Emira, which is a Canadian and US company, runs Nova Scotia Power. They built this transmission line and it's called the Maritime Link. For building that Maritime Link, they get about 44% of the power that comes out of Muskrat Falls for free for 35 years. Okay, so, what are they doing with that power? Remember I told you the reason why I decided I had to come down here was because of the Atlantic link. So what they're planning to do with that power that they're getting from us for free for building that link, well, not really free, but when you look at it the way we're looking at it, it, it really is for free because you'll find out soon why. So they're gonna take power from Colson Cove in New Brunswick and run it down through here and use the Muskrat Falls power as backup for the wind and use some of the Muskrat Falls power to sell to Plymouth, Massachusetts. So that was what made me decide it was time to come down here and have a chat and uh, let people know what we're going through up there. Just to let you know, this is Muskrat Falls. It's the upper Muskrat Falls before anything ever happened to it. We used to take a trip up to Muskrat Falls on Sunday afternoon, take our picnic basket if it was summertime, <laughs> or in the wintertime we'd take snowshoes and we'd take a tent and we'd make a fire and we would walk in from way out in here or, or take the snow machine in and we'd end up right about here and we'd come out here on these rocks and, and sit around and have our, our little lunch and it was like a really neat Sunday afternoon thing to do. A lot of people did that. This is the lower falls. There's two falls on Muskrat Falls, but right now they're both blocked. So right now you can't even tell there was a falls. This is a picture taken right about where we would sit and have our lunch. And as a matter of fact, I'd say that's exactly what someone was doing when that picture was taken. This picture here is the lower falls. And to the right is what is called Spirit Mountain. Um, the Innu believed that there was a bad spirit in that mountain. And for years they all, and they still do, uh, many of them, are, are afraid of that mountain. And I think we know why. Because beyond that mountain is the area that is going to be used for a natural dam. And that area is fraught with marine clay, which was laid down centuries and centuries ago when the ocean was in over all that land. And as it receded, slowly but surely it laid down this marine clay in layers. This marine clay is liquefiable. With the right amount of pressure and the right amount of water saturation, it can liquefy. They're gonna use that for a permanent dam, okay? Downstream from that dam and the other two dams, there are two communities. My community, Happy Valley Goose Bay, and the community of Mud Lake, which is about 70 people, 60, 70 people. The, the community of Mud Lake and the lower part of Happy Valley were actually flooded this summer for the first time in the history of the communities. And it happened because last fall, NALCOR claimed they had to raise the water level to 22 meters in order to protect the infrastructure. So I'll show you a picture of that infrastructure. Oh, wait a minute. Well, here's a little, this is a little bit better sh uh, showing of the North Spur. So here are the two waterfalls on Muskrat Falls. This is, uh, this is uh, Spirit Mountain, Manitou right here. And this is the area that really is full. All, this whole area right into here is full of nothing but quick clay. The, the oceans were right in over this for many, many centuries. This is quick clay right over here as well. So right here you can see there's a break 
and I have another picture later that'll show you that in 1978, that whole bank on the downstream side of the river caved in one night. Mm -hmm. A couple of trappers were up there and they were, there's a little island down this way and they were trap or uh, camped for the night and they said they heard this racket in the middle of the night and didn't know what it was. They woke up next morning and took their boat and they saw that whole bank was, uh, fell down into the water. So this is what the uh, south side of the river looks like now. Um, this is the uh, coffer dam. This is the one they put up so they could dewater this area and build the, the first dam. And then there would be another dam right over here. So both of those would be concrete and rock filled dams. Those two will hold back water. But the main dam to hold back the river is the North Spur. And it's fraught with quick, quick clay. So here's the North Spur as it sits right, or did then. Uh, you can see that they're working to try to uh, put riprap up, upstream. They've uh, cleared it. They've put uh, several um, uh, weeping drains or whatever they call it. They've put a curtain down 70 feet, and it's gone down to the top of the lower clay layer, this curtain or this uh, wall, they call it. Jim calls it a curtain because that's really all it is. It's just a membrane. And we've heard from geotechnical experts that depending how, on how this curtain was installed, that if they dropped rocks and debris behind that curtain or in front of it when they were installing it, that there's a possibility that water could start to seep through that anyway because, you know, when the pressure on the river uh, gets on top of it, then... But not only that, that below that, that uh, North Spur, there's it, the, the um, bedrock is 900 feet. So actually the North Spur doesn't have any bedrock. That part that they're going to use for a dam has no bedrock attached to it. Underneath that curtain and that lower clay layer, there's an aquifer. And actually the aquifer, if I want to go back to that, that picture, before there, that aquifer has, has, we believe, and so do geotechnical experts, that it, the river has built it, or pushed its way underneath the spur, and there's actually a huge deep hole right about here. And they believe that that's why the hole is there, because water is, is seeping underneath that. So there's a lot of fear for the people downstream that this thing is going to go. It's now at 22 meters. They've raised it up one more meter this year, so it's going to 23 meters. That's going to end up being 39 meters when it's finally finished. 39 meters of water uh, from a rushing river. There's nine rivers flow into this river from all up and down between uh, Musk uh, um, Churchill Falls and our, our uh, Muskrat Falls project. So all that water you know, rushing down during the spring when the spring runoff, and that's a vicious amount of water coming down that river and pushing on the North Spur. This is a picture, of, uh, an artist rendition of the uh, of the two dams when they're when they're finished. Um, makes it look kind of pretty, but it's not very pretty. So how did all this uh, how did all this situation come up? Uh, remember, I said that. Uh, we had a politician named Danny Williams who, who decided years ago because he had a great uh, monopoly or uh, not a monopoly. This is the monopoly. He had a majority. majority. Thank you. Um, he, decided, uh, he decided then, and this was his main reason for getting elected, that he wanted to do the Lower Churchill Project. That was going to be his legacy uh, project. So he started creating uh, a legislation that all the way through helped him and helped us, uh, not us, the Newfoundland government, um, lock in the Muskrat Falls project. So the first thing they did is they created a monopoly in Nalcor Energy. No one else in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador can build power to sell to the grid. No one. Not a wind project, not a solar project, nothing. Muskrat Falls is it. The Lower Churchill is it. So basically you can build, you can put up a wind turbine in your backyard if you wish, but if you produce more power than you're going to use, then you just 
it's just produced and lost because you can't sell it back on the grid. So conservation and demand side management is totally out of their minds, okay? And there was a reason for that. So they, they legislated that this was the, the, the monopoly. They also legislated that the Public Utilities Board has no control over Nalcor Energy. We do have a subsidiary of Nalcor Energy called Hydro, uh, Newfoundland Labrador Hydro. That is the regulated authority. However, the regulated authority has to buy the power from Nalcor from this project on a take or pay contract. That was legislated as well. So whatever the price Nalcor sets to, to sell the power to Hydro-Quebec, to, sorry, oh my, God forbid, if they sell the power to Hydro-Quebec, to Newfoundland Labrador Hydro, then the utilities board has no say over that. Like, that's an accepted fact. So if the power project goes from 2.3 billion, which it started out to be 10 years ago, then when it was sanctioned went to 6.6 .6 billion, and is now today, as of six months ago, at 12.7 billion, guess who gets to pay the bill? The ratepayers of Newfoundland and Labrador. Meanwhile, 44% is gonna be sold to Emira, not sold, given, because they produce the, uh, the maritime link. So of what's left that goes to Newfoundland for the Newfoundland people to use, every bit of that 12.7 billion, and I promise you, you will hear more about this. This is gonna be a 15 to 16 billion dollar project. The number of megawatts is 824. If you put the, the pencil to it and figure it out, it's 65 cents a kilowatt hour. It's the highest price power on the globe. So what they're gonna do with what they have left after they give some to Emira, they're going to um, blend the 65 cents with what Newfoundlanders pay now. This is the island of Newfoundland. We, in Labrador, we still buy our power from the upper Churchill at 3.8 cents a kilowatt hour. But you gotta remember something, for nine months out of the year in Labrador, we need heat, okay? So if, if these guys decide that our little pittance of people in Labrador have to pay the bill as well, then, I mean, I don't know how many people will be left in Labrador. I know for one thing, all my lights are going out, my wood stove is going straight like I'm gonna put in another one because I can't afford to pay those kind of prices. So they're gonna blend the 65 cents a kilowatt hour with what is already on the island at nine and 10 cents a kilowatt hour and they're gonna come up with somewhere around 27 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's what people are gonna be paying for their utilities. And we have no choice. Whatever Nalcor sets as the price is what we have to pay, or what they have to pay. And the worst thing about this is that the federal government insisted that this be done this way before they would give Newfoundland any guarantee of a loan guarantee. Newfoundland's rate, uh, credit rating is not nearly as good as the country, okay, of the, the Canadian federal government. So Newfoundland's credit rating was low enough that without the federal loan guarantee, this project would never ever have gone ahead. So the federal government guaranteed for 6.9 billion, but in order to guarantee that, they forced the Newfoundland government and Nalcor to put through this take or pay contract that said the ratepayers will pay the bill. In other words, they didn't want to be on the hook. They'll guarantee the loan, but they don't want to be on the hook. That was when it was 6.7 billion. When it went to 12.7, there was a big hullabaloo for, a, a, I don't know, weeks. We said, well, what's going to happen? Surely to God, the Canadian government is not crazy enough to go ahead and guarantee more money. Guess what? They were, and they did, 2.9 billion more. So they're now on the hook. The Canadians, all Canadians across the country, are now on the hook for, for 9.2, I think it is, if my math is right. 9.2 billion dollars if Newfoundland fails to pay this bill. And I don't know how 520,000 people on the island of Newfoundland are ever going to pay for this because not only are they going to have this 15 billion dollar debt for 50 or 60 years, they already had 9 billion dollars before they started this project. 
We were in debt by nine billion before we started. So I, I tend to get off on different um, aspects of this. So I'm going to pull it back a minute. So the privacy commissioner for um, for the um, access to information, there was an um, uh, access to information uh, legislation put through, and now is exempt from access to information. So we can't find out any of the details like. Site C just got reviewed, and the Site C project. Has anybody here ever heard of the Site C project? It's up in uh, British Columbia. It's a very contentious project. It's the same situation as in uh, Muskrat Falls. And the Aboriginal people were dead against this project. It's on the Peace River. And they fought against it, fought against it. And the government of the day said, forget you. We're going ahead with it anyway, which they did. And finally, um, we, they, they had a new government come in, the NDP, and the NDP said, wait a minute, they promised all the way through their, their uh, when they were campaigning that they were going to look at the Site C project. They did. They did a review. And now they're saying, yeah, you can stop this project. The sunk cost, they were only mostly salaries anyway, and that went back to, into our economy, so you can stop this project if you wish. Now, the decision hasn't been made, but for us, we still don't know what really has been spent because the access to information for this project has been exempted. So it doesn't matter what we try to find out as citizens who own this project. This is a crown corporation. All the projects across Canada are crown corporations, these, these utilities. They're owned by the citizens of the province. We are the shareholders. So we get benefits if benefits come up, but we also get the debt which means the, the rate payers have to pay the price, no matter what. And, you know, the federal government made sure of that when they gave us the loan guarantee. So no access to information on the NALCOR part. I put this little thing in about pay packets and privacy and why NALCOR says com contractor composition, compensation at Muskrat Falls is off, off limits. Well, like I said, um, access to information, we're exempt, they're exempt from that. They can say, now of course CEO can say, or any um, of the ATIPP um, folks can say, oh no, this is proprietary information, so it, it, you know, it could affect uh, this contractor. So what's happened with the Muskrat Falls project is we have all these contractors, people who have incorporated themselves, called themselves a corporation, gone to work for Nalcor at God knows what price. We figure between $100 to $200 an hour because they're engineers and specialists in, in whatever field. And we have no control. We can't even find out how much money we're paying them because the access to information on contracts is off limits to us. So is it any wonder it's gone from 2.9 billion to 6.7 billion to 12.7 billion? Because engineers and politicians and this, these utility companies across the entire of Canada, all they want to do is build. They got to build. If they're not building, what are engineers going to do? If utilities are not building, they can't sell to the United States, can they? If they're only building for what we need, then they don't need to build anymore because we don't need any more power. There are a few places where we could do a lot better with our demand side management and that kind of thing, but we have enough power in Canada right now that if we had a proper transmission grid, we could just stop right now and not go any further. Okay, so I've already talked about the take or pay contract. This was a young fellow named Nick Mercer. He came up to Newfoundland about two months ago and did a, came up to Labrador, sorry, and did a presentation uh, on wind energy. And he's, he's doing his, um, his dissertation or his PhD on wind energy. And his statement to us in that little presentation was that it is essentially against the law in Newfoundland and Labrador right now to build wind. And that's the truth. And where is everyone in the world or in, in, the, in the, our world going with renewable energy? They're going with wind and solar and a, a bit of biomass here and there and demand side management and conservation, right? But right now it's against the law to build wind in Newfoundland. Uh, 
NALCOR is also exempt from the Public Tendering Act. So we don't know when a, when a contract comes in. You know, normally as a shareholder, you'd be able to look at those contracts, right? Not in this case. And that brings up something else because, uh, no, I just lost my train of thought on that. It'll come again. <laughs> okay, so besides all of these, all of these things that we can't find out about contractors and contracts and money, Nalcor has been mismanaging this project from day one. They were never ever qualified to build a, a, a project of this size. The, the, the fellow that runs the project, his name is Gilbert Bennett, he was actually a cable guy. And we, <laughs> it's funny, we always laugh about it and call him the cable guy whenever we get a chance. And it, I think it kind of irritates him, but that's okay. <laughs> anyway, we like to irritate him, to tell you the truth. Um, but the fact that this has gone from 6.2 billion to 12.7 billion is not, it wasn't an accident, okay? So we had, two engineers who had worked for Nalcor, who one of them came to a blogger in this called the unclenarlyblog.com. If you uh, go online, you can read tons of information about this project and all of the other issues that I can't possibly go into tonight. But one of them went to the blogger. The other fellow even went on CBC, but he, the fellow in the blogger would not put his name he, he had to be anonymous because he signed a, an agreement when he went to work for Nalcor that he would not disclose anything. The fellow that went on CBC even had his voice changed. But why would these people tell lies? Why would they put their jobs or their former jobs, because I don't think either one of them works for the company anymore, but why would they put themselves in jeopardy if they didn't feel there was something really wrong with this project? And we know that. It, you know, common sense tells you people don't, they don't just come out and, and say stuff like that. If they wanted all that attention, they'd tell their names. They'd let you know who they were. But they, they're not allowed because it's against the law for them to disclose anything. So they were told, according to these two engineers, they were told up front when all of this project started, there was a conflict between whether this project was going to cost more or less than the alternatives. The alternatives being small hydro projects on the island of Newfoundland. They got plenty of rivers out there they could put tiny projects on and produce the power that they needed. They claimed they needed the power. So those small projects, but, but there's been a moratorium on uh, hydro projects on the island of Newfoundland for years. Not in Labrador, however, as is obvious. So there was small hydro projects, there was, uh, um, uh, wind energy and solar. All of that was in on this side and Nalcor Energy's new Muskrat Falls project was on this side and they were told, these engineers were told, you keep those contracts below seven billion no matter what you have to do. And they did. It was 6.7 billion. Okay? So they were lower than the alternatives and that was the reason. And for first two years after this project started, we had no information about what the actual cost was. Only when the new CEO took over about a year ago did we find out that 12.7 billion was where it was at at this point. So they kept all that to themselves. Here's another thing they, they did that was just so... Uh, I, <laughs> this is a, a, a dome. This, this company named Astaldi from, uh, from um, Italy came, they were pouring the concrete for the, um, for the um, spillway structure. And they said, we can pour the concrete all winter. Yes, we'll get it done on time and under budget. So we'll pour all, all winter, we're going to build a dome, and then we can heat it, and we'll be able to pour concrete the whole winter. Well, they got it half done like this, and they found out they couldn't keep the heat up enough. Labrador winters are very, uh, they're unforgiving when it comes to heating a building, a metal building of that size. So, one day I'm sitting at my desk looking out at the road and down the road from me about a mile and a half is a junkyard. And I see these trucks going by with all these pieces, huge pieces of steel, like full flatbed tractor trailers with pieces of steel on there as long as the trailer itself. And here's what they were doing. They, they dismantled this this entire dome 
and now they can't pour during the winter. So it's already three years behind schedule. It's $120 million gone down the drain. Can we find out whether or not we're going to pay that bill or a Staldi? No, because there's no access to information. Now Core claims that that's a Staldi's bill. Yet Astaldi went back to Nalcor several months later and demanded another half million dollars and got it. Duh. Another one, another waste. They put in uh, 340 kilometers of DC power uh, cord, conductor wire. It was spun at the factory, shipped, stored, and erected before anyone at Nalcor knew that it had an issue. One of the wires that was supposed to be wound in tight was loose. And if you've looked at the island of Newfoundland, um, the northern, Great Northern Peninsula, that long section that comes down on the, on the west side, that is the long range mountains. That's where that power uh, transmission line is gonna go. And the wind and ice, rime ice, and conditions around that area are so bad, they said there is no way that this wire can stand up. It could start to fray, and once it does, it's going to be, you know, hell to pay for, uh, for 800 megawatts of power. And Emira is not going to have reliability. The island of Newfoundland is not going to have re reliability, and it's going to be out for a while. So they took it all down every bit of it. Can we find out whether or not the, the, the person, the people who built it over in China get to pay for it? Or do we pay for it? We can't find out because there's access to information is blocked. We don't know. This is the cord. 400,000 cubic meters of wood has been cut in the transmission corridors all the way down through, this is just one small pile. If you could see what we see piled up along the sides of the highways up in Labrador, sitting there to rot. I belong to a little group called a Third Signatory. We're a, we're a uh, forestry monitoring committee. There's four of us. We've stuck with it for like seven years since forestry was going gung-ho years ago. It slowed right down because the government um, decided to do a proper forestry plan. They did a they do a, a, a sustainable forestry plan where lots of trees are left in special places so that they can grow back and so on. And we worked through all that for a couple of years. And we stayed with it because of the monitoring afterwards. We wanted to make sure all of this uh, happened the way it was supposed to and so on. So we said before this project ever started, the forestry department finds something to do with this wood before Nalcor ever cuts it sitting there rotting for three years now. The other bad part of that is on the coast of Labrador, they don't have the kind of power we have from Churchill Falls because it's too expensive to send a wire out to these communities on the coast of Labrador. So they're on diesel. And they're only allowed so much heat and electricity off diesel because the diesel plants can't handle it. So they use wood stoves. This wood could have been shipped on a, on a barge, and they could have had enough wood stored in uh, shelters for probably five or 10 years. Not done. This is just, a, I, I think that one's in the wrong place, but here's a picture of the landslide. It's all grown over with, uh, with trees now, but that's, uh, that was the big landslide that happened in 1978 on the North Spur. So the other big issue that we have, um, no, this is the same issue, sorry, we're, we're still back with the North Spur. So we've been talking about the North Spur with Nalcor Energy. We, we, you know, we presented at the hearings for the environmental assessment for this project. We begged them to, to do independent work on this North Spur. For various reasons, we did not trust Nalcor. We did not trust their engineer. Their engineer, by the way, is SNC-Lavalin. SMC Lavalin was uh, was kicked off the uh, Canadian uh, in Canadian Development Association. The in international uh, group will not uh, allow SNC Lavalin to do work for them right now. SNC Lavalin is also in court in Montreal on a hospital that they built um, because they paid somebody off under the table, and this has happened in various appar apparently has happened in various. Uh, uh, countries around the world. So 
who is our contractor? Who is our engineer? SNC Lavalin. So we didn't trust all of that. And the North Spur is extremely important because it's 36 kilometers above where our communities are. If that thing fails in 45 minutes, we're going to be underwater. My house is going to be underwater. So it's not just, I'm not standing here just for everybody else. I'm thinking about my place going underwater that I've been building for 14 years. So we said, okay, if you won't give us an independent review, we're going to look for one ourselves. So we went to Sweden and we found this fellow named Dr. Stig Bernander and we call him the rock star of quick clay, okay? <laughs> and he really is. He did his PhD in quick clay when he was 82 years old. And he was worried because for years, I mean, Sweden has the same kind of issue. Sweden, Denmark, Norway, they have quick clay as well. They've had horrible f failures from quick clay, deaths from, from quick clay failures. Over there, they call it Lida clay. There is a video on YouTube, if you have time to look it up, it's called, the town is called Riza, R-I-Z-Z-A, Riza, Norway. Just so happened that a farmer was excavating an area to put an extension onto his barn. And he took out soil uh, to the depth of four feet or so as, and the length that he needed for the uh, new barn extension. And he dropped the soil at the edge of the river. But before he could finish the excavation, that soil, the pressure from that soil made that whole riverbank fail and the entire farmland Houses and everything went out. It was just, it totally liquefied. There happened to be a young fella taking photos over on a mountain off the side. And that video, that RZA video, it's very poor as far as techno technologically because it was done years ago with an old camera, but you have to watch it. I'm telling you that when that quick clay fails, it fails fast and it doesn't slow down because it's like dominoes. You can push on the first domino and ease it over, but once it touches that first one, that's it. They're all gone. And that's exactly what happens with quick clay. So we asked Dr. Bernander to come over. We found some money and paid his trip over. And he came up, he, he presented to the LSPU Hall in St. John's to a full house. Um, then he came to Labrador. We took him up in the helicopter and he looked at the entire river valley. <laughs> He looked at places and said, those are they're perfect examples of downhill progressive slides. Nalcor, in their report to the uh, joint panel in the environmental assessment, said there is no evidence of downhill progressive slides in this river valley. Dr. Bernander pointed out an ancient downhill progressive slide directly to me. We ended up at Gull Island. The helicopter was kind of turning to come back around from Gull Island, which where the, the 300 foot dam will go. And he looked over and he, he looked around and we were talking in these little earphones in the uh, helicopter and he said, Roberta, <laughs> this is an example of an ancient downhill progressive slide. I said, thank you, Dr. Bernander. Really makes me feel safe, you know. <laughs> so that is the rock star of, uh, and we've had him look at this. We've had him look at every document that we could get from Nalcor and their uh, engineers. And he's decided that it's just, it's not enough. And they haven't done the right studies. And they haven't used the right methods to do the studies because that's what he did his engineering PhD in. This is another retired engineer, Jim Gordon. He believes Bernander is correct, and he's uh, helped us along the way. All of these, these people have done this for free. They, you know, they're not getting any money from us. We don't have any money to give them. So why would these older people, you know, it's the same story with the engineers. Why would they waste their energy? And I mean, Dr. Bernander has written five reports. We just got the last one on November the 26th. And that's the one where he uh, quoted here, in the opinion of this author, Dr. Bernander, he said the Nalcor energy response generally reflects little interest or lack of know-how of the intricacies related to highly porous soils and the conditions of sensitivity that may lead to downhill or forward progressive failure development in potentially extensive landslides. 
Furthermore, there are specific important issues which have not been dealt with in reference to 9D, among other, the efficiency and the reliability of the finger drains. So I'll show you a, a quick photo of some of the quick clay. Now that doesn't look very sloppy there, but if you walk up this, uh, if you take this clay in your hand, we used to go down by the riverbank and we do like this in the soil, and in a minute or so you'd be up to your ankles. And we used to call it quick quicksand. Well, it's quick clay, but never mind. So right here is the, this is the finger drains. They're re, uh, putting in some uh, rock here, and they're putting a, a membrane, and and that's on the downhill side of the project. And they figure that the the any water that drains from the river upstream is going to drain down and come through and not bother this uh, this uh, natural dam. This is quick clay, all, all these dark spots down there, if you walk up and grab a hold of that and smack it with your hand like this, it, it just becomes water, it's watery. There they are working on that again. This is a particularly scary area. This is the, the Spirit Mountain here on the left. This little area right here is where the trappers used to go when they, they would portage up over this land and go upstream to do their trapping and they went up that way because there was a little brook there so they'd, they'd portage all their belongings up over the hill, down over the other side, and then go on upriver. That area is where most of the engineers we've talked to feel is going to fail first, right there next to that rock knoll. This is more quick clay. We had paddled up the river and uh, uh, got out on the, uh, on the sand right over beside the, the North Spur. And you, like I said, you can pick this stuff up in your hand and rub it, and it just becomes quick uh, muddy. We had a, another um, uh, fellow who, who was a driller on this project. I kind of blanked out his name at the bottom. His name is actually on the bottom of these, uh, these drill cores. And he took pictures of it because he said, I, I can't go to sleep at night without calling somebody and telling them what's coming up out of, that, out of those drill cores. He just took a, a, a paddle or a putty knife or something and just kind of hit them so you can see that that's real soft. So that's one issue. We have one, one major issue, and that's the quick clay, okay? That can drown people if that, north, if that north spur fails. The next big issue is the methylmercury. So it has a long history with no resolution, methylmercury. Harvard studies show that Nalcor's assertion that there would be no effects beyond the mouth of the river are wrong. Nunatsiavut, which is the Inu uh, Inuit uh, government in Newfoundland, in Labrador, they're the only Aboriginal group that ha actually has a land claim settled. Uh, Nunatsiavut had to hire Harvard on their own to refute Nalcor's claims. So what Nunatsiavut did, they settled their land claim and, and their land is not within this project footprint, if you want to count the land as a footprint, but they were pretty astute. They knew this project would probably go ahead at some point. So when they settled their land claim, they put a little uh, section in the bottom of the land claim that said any water, if, if any project in the future affects water that runs beside our land, then that, is, that gives us the right to question and be involved in it. And that's exactly what they did. And that's why they called Harvard, because the water coming out of this river is going to be fraught with quick clay, with um, methylmercury. And they knew that. But Nalcor continuously said that there would be no effects beyond the mouth of the river. And why they said that is that they, they figured, or they tried to explain to everyone, that when the land is flooded, when the reservoir is flooded, the mercury is in the soil already, okay? It gets flooded when the reservoir water is raised, and in fact, the uh, mercury drops into the water and is acted on by a bacteria, and it's methylated, so it becomes methyl mercury, which is taken up by um, uh, plankton, and then it's taken up by small fish, who are taken up by big fish and who eventually get taken up by seal meat. And then our people in Nunatsiavut and the rest of us, uh, we go out to get our seals in the spring and we eat seal meat that's full of methylmercury or full of mercury. So, so uh, they said that 
that the uh, water that comes out of the river, it wouldn't affect anything beyond the mouth of the river because they said it would be mixing right there at the mouth of the river. Because our river is a, um, an ocean-fed uh, river, not ocean-fed, but it's a tidal river, so the salt water comes in, the fresh water comes out, and they said it would mix right here and there wouldn't be any effects. But what, what Harvard University found out is that is not the truth. In fact, it's even worse than we figured because the salt water is a lot, there's a lot of salt water and it's a thick layer at the bottom. The fresh water comes out with the uh, carbon and all of the bacteria in the, in the fresh water and it kind of lays in a layer on the top of the salt water. And in fact, right there is where more methylmercury is produced than any of them thought. So an, Inu, an Inuit person or an Innu person or a Métis person, or even a settler like me from Newfoundland, if we're out there and we eat uh, on a regular basis, seal meat, trout, smelts, salmon, birds, anything, and these people have to do that because the price of food is way expensive. If they eat on a regular basis a full diet of this, and they continue to do that after this project comes on stream, they will, in fact, have raised mercury levels in their body to the tune of 1,500%. That's an extreme case, okay? 400%, 500%, that's not extreme. So what Nalcor plans to do is issue consumption advisories. And I gotta tell you, to issue a consumption advisory to people who have to pay 15 and $20 for a few old hamburgers, that's just out outrageous. They, they, it's cultural genocide. I had a woman that came up to my kennels this summer and she dropped off two of her dogs. Her and her husband went on up north on the uh, Northern Ranger for a trip and they went into Hopedale and she needed to get some things at the, at the uh, government store, the, the uh, excuse me, the grocery store. And she took a picture of, um, when I said hamburgers, the reason I said it is because she took a picture of four hamburgers in a package that had been marked down 50%. They were marked down because they were freezer burned. They were originally $28.99 for four hamburgers, and they had them marked down to $14.50. This is what we're expecting people on the north coast of Labrador to pay for if they can't use the food that they normally eat from seals and fish and birds and mammals. Like, it's, it's beyond me how our government can even consider such a thing. And this is a government store. We don't, there's no, no grocery store is going to put uh, grocery stores on the coast of Labrador. You can't make any money. This is the government store. So, so between Grand River Keeper and the Labrador Land Protectors, we've been pr pressuring our government for two years to investigate NALCOR. We wanted them to do a forensic audit to have an independent review of the entire project. We wrote a letter to our, to our premier back in May. We sent along a thousand signatures with it. We didn't even get a notice that the letter was received and it was hand delivered. Not a word from our premier, okay? Uh, we've had a lot of resistance to this, not just writing letters, not just contacting MPs and, and, uh, and uh, uh, MHAs. This is my friend, my best friend, Jim Learning. Jim has been in jail twice for pushing to stop this project from destroying the river and the hunting grounds where he's hunted all his life and poisoning the food and putting people's lives in danger. The first time he went to jail, he went on a hunger strike for 10 full days. We finally talked, he's, he's a 21 year cancer patient. So we finally talked him out of the hunger strike after 10 days and he got out of jail. He's just been back in jail now about uh, several months ago. Him and four, three people, three other people, Eldred Davis, Jim Learning, and two of our Inuit grandmothers, and they were sent out to St. John's to the men's maximum security prison for fighting against methylmercury problems and the destruction of the land and the possible drowning of people. They went to jail because Nalcor Energy is meshed with the government so tight that they were able to get a really huge and all-encompassing injunction against anyone and anybody, persons unknown. 
they named Jim Learning. They named five or six people. And at the bottom they said, and persons unknown. So anybody that walked near their place could be arrested. And 60 of them were. 60 of them are going to court right now, going through the courts. Just a couple of pictures of what we like to do on this river. This is a, a world-class paddling river. Anybody that has any idea about how to pick up a paddle and, and uh, get the canoe to move along, you can, you can paddle down this river. It's got a few really tough places, but you know that's just a bit of fun. So we, we really could have done a lot with uh, a tourism and local jobs, local uh, uh, outfitting places. It, it, it just would have been a beautiful place. Um, Elizabeth and Frances Panashaway, the Innu elder and her husband, have paddled this river. We've been taking people down this river now for years. Every time we get a chance, we take whoever wants to go down the river. It's a 10-day trip. It's, you see no one but your, your own group for 10 whole days, usually. And you can't get off that river. If you have an accident, you just got to call for a helicopter. There's really no place to get off. It's a, a really wonderful experience to be on that river, totally alone, totally out of cell phone service, totally away from public for a whole nine to 10 days. And Elizabeth and Frances Benashway have been doing that now since 1998. Frances passed away a couple of years ago. Elizabeth did the, the trip again last year. And you know we did the trip again last year. We keep trying to do it year after year to try to let people know what a beautiful river it is and why it shouldn't be dammed. So our river is not the only river that's uh, slated for dams. I have a book at home that's about that thick. Nalcor, actually not Nalcor, before Nalcor, this was Newfoundland Labrador Hydro, studied all the rivers in southern Labrador. The Eagle River is studied for hydro. Eagle River is one of the world-renowned salmon rivers. Uh, George Bush Sr. Has, pa has paddled, <laughs> has fished this river, so has Prince Philip, and I, you know, I couldn't even name all of the other dignitaries that have been on this river. It's a fantastic river. Uh, the Kenemu River, the Paradise, the Alexis, the St. Lawrence, the Pinware, all of those rivers have been studied for hydro. So not, not, are we just talking about Muskrat Falls? No. Are we just talking about Muskrat Falls and Gull Island? No. We're talking about every river in Labrador that has the potential for any kind of hydro project. They will eventually dam it if they can possibly get away with it. But it's not just Labrador. It's across Canada. And the reason they can get away with it across Canada is because it's in the north. And just like us, we've got 27,000 people in the land the size of Texas. We need jobs. People need jobs. People need to survive. And that's what they use against us. And then we have three Aboriginal groups. And they do that. They go in and they give one Aboriginal group a deal. And that pits the other two Aboriginal groups against that Aboriginal group, and so on. And it's, it's not, it doesn't happen just in Labrador. It happens all across Canada. It's been happening here in the United States. And I'm sure you folks know exactly what I'm talking about. Just a quick uh, a little update. When I talk about all the rivers across Canada and why it's concerning to me that, that it, it's not just our river. I mean, we're on the east side. Site C is over in British Columbia on the, on the very far west side. All, both of them up north. There are, you know, Manitoba Hydro has got power contracts and power uh, projects that they want to build. They are almost broke. They're almost in bankruptcy. Ontario Hydro is in trouble. They have, they have all kinds of projects they're working on. Quebec, on the other hand, can, can say that they have 5,000 megawatts to spare. And why they have, if they, if they have 5,000 megawatts to spare, we're not sure of that, but if they do, it's because they build these projects in, on purpose so that they can have it to spare so they can sell it down here to the United States. And that's exactly the justification for our project was exactly that. They said we needed the project. We needed the power. We don't need that power. We got 5,500 megawatts up there that we're going to own in 2041. We don't need that power. They build them because they know they can sell them. And they build them because 
They are crown corporations, and no matter how expensive it is to build them, the ratepayers in the province are going to pay the bill. This young fellow here on the left, Joel Heath, is a scientist. And Joel was in, uh, in the Belcher Islands for about seven years. He sat with um, a little, uh, like a little tent built around him and a little hole in the, in the tent so he could put his camera out. And he had a camera down in the water so he could watch. And what he was there for is because the people of the Belcher Islands live by the eider duck. Okay, they use the fur for their clothes. You can see two of their coats right here. They use the fur to, to make clothing. They sell the feathers. Fur, I mean feathers. <laughs> fur, fin, feather, right? <laughs> they sell the, the, fur, the feathers for, uh, for profit, and they eat the ducks. But their ducks were dying, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. So if you can, in, if you can visualize uh, Hudson Bay. Hudson Bay comes from the left, from the west down, and then James Bay and comes up the side, right by Quebec and Labrador, okay? The Belcher Islands are about almost half, halfway between the middle, and uh, so the currents for the, for the Hudson Bay come down one side, go down around and come up and go around Labrador. What he found about the eider ducks was that all this water, this fresh water that's being released in the winter time, which is abnormal, the fresh water is normally released in the spring with the spring melt. And of course in the spring, the ice is melting anyway. It's being released now by Hydro-Quebec and all these projects they have up in James Bay and, and Hudson Bay. It's released in the winter. It is fresh water. It is freezing these ducks in and they're dying. They can't get down to get their food. They dive for their food. So this is what he has found, and he's, he's working more uh, with more of it. He's back up in the Belcher Islands, now we understand, for another year or so, and he'll be doing more studies. He's getting the community involved. They're learning what they have to do, but, you know, still, Hydro-Quebec is generating in the dead of winter, releasing all that fresh water out of those reservoirs, and the eider ducks are suffering because of it. Never mind the eider ducks, the people of Santa Kilowack are suffering because of it. There's a video that you should uh, try to see. If you, it's a documentary. If you ever get a chance, it's called People of a Feather. And that video is what Joel put together as a documentary from his seven years of sitting in a box. He always, in the video, he says, here I am sitting in the box watching the ducks. <laughs> That's what he did for, you know, off and on for seven years. And, and very patiently watched everything that was happening, when the water was released, how it was freezing, how fast it was freezing, the whole thing. Now he is saying, without having time to study this, but that water that comes up and goes down the side of Labrador uh, uh, from Hudson Bay is affecting the Labrador current. The Labrador current affects all kinds of climate. It's a, it's a thermo, I think it's called the thermocline, it underturns like this and, and affects the, the climate in Europe and of course it affects the climate in Labrador. So he hasn't had time to do a lot of studies on that, but he has said that this is what he suspects. So hydro, my point is that hydro projects around the world, these big projects are doing more harm than they're ever doing good. And you stop and think about those few projects that are in Canada, even if we only have three rivers that are not dammed, there are 67,000 large hydro dams in the world. And all of those hydro projects are doing the same types of damage. They create methylmercury when they flood the reservoirs. They are holding uh, um, nutrients behind dams. That affects fish, wildlife. There is so much wrong with large hydro projects. And that's why I had to come down here and talk to you folks and let you know that there's a human part to this and there's a, a an environmental part to this, there's a financial part, but then again, who cares about the financial part when people's lives are at stake, when people's livelihoods are at stake? Like, I don't care how much money they've spent, I want them to stop this project, I want them to do a proper forensic study, I want them to do an 
an independent review, not some engineers that the government or NALCOR decided to pull in. I want an independent review. I want us to be able to look at the, the credentials from these people and, and know as best as we can that they have no connection to our government or to NALCOR Energy or SNC Lavalin or any of these other contractors has already worked on this project. I may be wishing in one hand and, you know, dreaming in the other. I don't know. But anyway, so the resistance. Just to let you know, we haven't been sitting down. For years, we've been resisting this project. There we are, all of us, in, the, in a, a rainy day in front of NALCOR's uh, gates. They allowed us a small area over on the other side of the gates, and they said, you can go over there and wave your flags and holler your chants. Well, what good is that? How good is that for, for a, a protest? How can you protest something by waving your flags? I mean, they just ignore us. They just drive on by. So what happened was people went on the site and they shut it down. They sneaked into the gate and 60 people went on the site and shut that project down for five days. And when they did that, three of our little Inuit young people went on a hunger strike. Three day, uh, uh, 10 days they stayed on a hunger strike. And while they were hunger striking, of course, the uh, media was picking this up and it was going all across Canada. It was coming down here even. And so the government was embarrassed. NALCOR was embarrassed and they said, hey, what are we gonna do about this? My God, let's get the Aboriginal leaders out and let's figure out what we can do. So they brought the Aboriginal leaders out to St. John's. They had an 11 hour meeting and they came out and said, okay, you guys can get off your hunger strike. We've made a deal. And the deal is this. NALCOR has to raise the water. This was last year, just a year ago in June. NALCOR has to raise the water level to 22 meters to protect their infrastructure that's already built. But they will drop it in the spring, and we will bring in scientists to look at every aspect of the reservoir to see what has to be removed, the soil, the trees, the bushes. We will have scientific knowledge only. It'll be all science-based, so you can stop your hunger strike, and everybody can go home, and we're all happy. And so the three young people were in Ottawa at our MP's office, and when they heard this, they were called immediately. And that's, you know, obviously, they would be the first ones these people would call. And so uh, Yvonne said that uh, our MP, she said, well, we fed them uh, smoked char. They hadn't eaten in 10 days. I can't imagine, because that, that would give me, if I hadn't eaten in 10 days, that would give me a burn. But anyway, they had their smoked char. Happy that something had come of their hunger strike. They'd been on for 10 days. This year, spring came. Nothing happened. We started screaming. Finally, on the 21st day of June, what's the 21st day of June? First day of spring, first day of summer, right? 21st day of June, they said, okay, 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 we're gonna drop the water levels. So they started to drop the water levels and two days later, they screamed they had to stop. Guess what? Because the water was up 22 meters, the banks of the river had all fallen in upstream and they had to stop because they were going to end up with a full reservoir and it wasn't going to be full of water. It was going to be full of sand. Now, my group, six of us paddled that river after that happened. We left Gull Island and we paddled down to just above the project. And we have pictures and I wish I had some of them here, but they, they're on one of the other gals that was with us. It's on her camera. But you could see along the banks of the river these ovals. Remember how that oval looked that, that failed? It, you know, huge at the bottom and goes up to a, like an oval. They were, they were like this. All the, they were like concave areas all down the river. And you could see that it was right where it started, right where the water level had been, because it was a dark area. And you could see the quick clay all up and down that area. So first of all, <laughs> we don't even think they're going to end up with very much power out of this project because if all this sand caves in, where's the water going to go? I mean, it's just going to broaden out and broaden out, and they're going to have to put another dam in somewhere to, to kind of hold it all together. So anyway, that's, um, that's a little detail about uh, how, uh, 
how all of that resistance came down and you know we still have 60 people going through the courts a few of them have signed uh, uh, undertakings saying they won't go near Al an Alcor anymore and I mean it breaks their hearts to do that because they fought so hard um, I look at Jim Learning and I you know he's one of the, the fellow I showed you the picture of he's one of the guys that says like I, I don't want a grandstand but would it help if I went back to jail and I'm saying no, no, we're done. We're done going to jail. We got to go down and talk to the people in the United States. We got to ask you to look at all those projects, those those uh, uh, transmission lines that are being proposed, and say to you, please, do not allow them to bring this power into your state because it's not clean and it's definitely not green. Thank you. These are a couple of our grandmothers, by the way. They were, they were arrested and they're, uh, they're coming out of the uh, paddy wagon with their hands in handcuffs. This, uh, the, this gal right here on the right, uh, Marjorie Flowers, she's one of the grandmothers that went to St. John's to the men's maximum security prison for 10 days for fighting for freedom to, to eat the food that she's eaten all her life and to not get drowned or for her friends not to get drowned. I'll stop now. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, NALCOR, what do the letters stand for? Uh, Newfoundland Labrador Corporation. This is a, a crown corporation? Yes. It belongs to the, to the provincial to the government? Yes. So if, if, the, if it fails, it's the provincial government that's, that's right. left holding, that's the people of that province will be left holding the back. That's right, exactly. Yes? There's no regulatory oversight is what it sounds like. Exactly. The, the, the NALCOR is so powerful. Let me tell you a little quick story, a little side story that just happened, okay? NALCOR has gone into communities and offered infrastructure. NALCOR, the utility. They've offered infrastructure to not protest their project. So just recently they signed on with Nuna Tuavut, the Métis people, and Todd Russell, their president, signed on to an agreement for eight million dollars. I mean, eight million dollars. Who is going to pay that? Is Nalcor Energy going to use that as a capital expenditure? Or are they going to say that's the cost of doing business and put that on Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro and charge it to us? We don't know that. In fact, one of our, our supporters, uh, David Vardy, has just sent an access to information request in asking that very exact question. That $8 million, where does that go? Is that now course, is that out of their 8% that they're guaranteed profit? Or is that going to come out of our utility bill? Whether we get an answer on that, it's probably, it's questionable. I doubt we'll get an answer, but yeah. It's, it costs us. You, you mentioned several sites, websites that we can go to get more information. Yes. One of them that I have used is the Damnation site. Yes. Why don't you talk just briefly about that? Because that's, a, I found, a very important site of information on it. The Damnation site is about uh, dams here in the United States. Am I correct? No, it also treats the ones, these. The, the, these. Yeah. No. The no. ones that I've been reading them, yes. Oh, really? They have, they have our project on their site? on the, the, the literature that they're making available. Oh, it, good. It oh, turns, I'm glad to hear that. I did not know that. I did not know that. So if anybody's interested in it, I can ask me and uh, I can forward you the, the website. Excellent. That Excellent. Yeah, Damn Nation, we, we saw that video. Um, uh, you, you know, we're, we're a member of the Waterkeeper Alliance. We've got a couple of issues with that because Lake Champlain Lake Keeper has signed on to the clean water um, uh, transmission line to, to not oppose it for their share of $287 million. We also have, the, yeah, the clean energy. Thank you, Annie. We also have the Hudson River Keeper, who was the first river keeper ever to be, um, to be a river keeper. And they've signed on to the uh, Champlain Hudson Power Express 
to take their share of $117 million. But we know that that power at any given time that comes down either one of those transmission lines could be coming from our river. So we've got a bit of a conflict going on there, and it's going to be a tough, a tough talk. Yes, Annie Wilson would like to say a few I, words. I would like to ask what happened with the Northern Pass and the presidential permit last week? It was approved. Anybody take a look at it? Northern Pass? Yeah. That's, Didn't it get that there, is, there was, I think there was a, one, another federal approval in the last two or three weeks. Um, but uh, New Hampshire still hasn't granted. Uh, permission. The state has not. The state issue. has not. Okay. Okay, good. And so are they looking to modify the path? Or I haven't tried make it subterranean? No, they, they're burying some of it. Um, I don't know, 20 miles. I don't do you know. No. Yeah. Not much, but yeah. And they've done the same, you know, strategy, trying to put money here and there oh, in yes. local communities who don't have a lot of jobs. But that's a private corporation, am I not right? It's, uh, yeah. So that's their money. Yeah. So if they feel that they can afford to do that, that's one thing. But when our corporation does that, that's our money. When they're paying off a portion of our population to get them on side so that they can look good and say, oh, we have two Aboriginal groups now that we are dealing with and that we've made deals with. Right? But they're making deals with the uh, leaders of these groups and the few at the top that run the groups. And I'm going to tell you that if I go back and show you these, these photos right here of the people that are being arrested, they're Aboriginal people mostly. They're Inuit, they're Innu, and they're mixed, bread, mixed bloods, uh, Nunatuvut, and us, the settlers. They're all together and they're saying we're not going with what our leaders tell us. So they're trying to conquer and divide. They, they do that very well with our own money, but, the, but it's not working. It's not working. We're not, we're not as naive as we used to be. We know a bit more. And thank God for Facebook cause, and, and social media, because honestly, I know it's a pain sometimes, but it's the only way we've been able to get our, our um, all our information out there. Hi, yes. Is there a technical solution of any kind to extract the methane mercury out of the water? Uh, there, there have been some proposals, but they're also tremendously expensive. It isn't possible. The, the best way is to take the soil out before you flood the reservoir. Get the soil out of there. Then there's a question about where are you going to put it? Because the mercury is in the soil. So if you're going to put it over here in this pile, you got to make sure that it's lined and that the mercury doesn't leak out anyway. So the quick clay is the culprit. No, 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 no sorry. You're, yeah, there's a confusion. The quick clay is one, is one issue. Right. The methyl mercury is another issue, OK? The Harvard study, please explain. Yes, the Harvard study is at makemuskratright.com. I'll go back to that, uh, if you want to write down that. You see most of the people carrying signs with make muskrat right. Ah, so it's way back, way back. Pardon me? Funded by the Inuit to look at yes. the impacts of downstream fish. Here it is, www.makemuskratright.com. The whole entire Harvard study is there. There's also a synopsis of the study that's easy to read and gives you the conclusions. So if you want to take a look at that, that's, uh, that's the best way. And, and there's also another, uh, there's one, there's a, a, a site called uh, Vision 2041. That's a Facebook site. There's a ton of information on there about this project. There's the Grand River Keeper site, which is just simply Grand River Keeper Labrador Facebook site. There's also the Labrador Land Protectors Facebook site. And uh, we have a gal named Denise Cole. She's a, an Aboriginal gal with Nunatuvut, uh, uh, the Métis folks. And she is just prolific. She posts everything. And she posts on our site, on their site, and on two or three other sites. Everything that comes out, she posts there. So if you're interested in, in getting some inf more information, there's also Another good one that there's always um, 
uh, um, archived information on this site, and it's called UncleGnarly.com. Uncle Gnarly spelled G-N-A-R-L-E-Y. Sir, did you have a question? You mentioned the date 2041. Yes. What is that about? Well, 2041 is the day that uh, supposedly, <laughs> as, of, as far as we know now, that the Quebec contract is up. And that the 5,500 megawatts from the upper Churchill will revert back to Newfoundland. Newfoundland is in, in court constantly about this so-called uh, one-sided contract. I read in the news that uh, they are already looking into this contract. Maybe there are several contracts. Uh, that I, I think the laboratory power is supposed to have been already reverted back to Newfoundland. But it, uh, well, they, they actually, they, when they signed the 1960 contract, they also had a 25-year additional contract in it. And that happened in 2015. I get my math right, 15 to 41, does that 25 years? Yeah. Something like that. So in 2015, the 25 year one kicked in and the entire project supposedly goes back to Newfoundland in 2041. So it's called Vision 2041, which is not that far away. And if Newfoundland had you know, done a few alternatives for what they needed on the island, and in fact, they don't need it. They claimed that the need for power on the island was going up and up and up and up. Now Corp made fictitious numbers all the way. In fact, the power needs on the island have gone down. And down enough that they didn't even need Muskrat Falls. They didn't build it for the people on the island. They built it to sell to the people down here. That's a fact of life. And because we're going to pay for it, that's the way it goes, and that's what Hydro-Quebec does, and that's what we do in Newfoundland. It's the same. Uh, one could add that like the Quebec electricity will be coming through the Northern Pass, and what is coming out of Nalcor is pretty much indistinguishable, because Nalcor sells to Hydro-Quebec, Nalcor is coming down mm. on the east board, Hydro-Quebec is coming on the western side. They often promote their power as being backed up by wind power, well, the fact is 95% of electricity is produced by large dams. That's right. So that politically correct large wind, maybe they might be better off uh, bringing down their carbon footprint in Quebec by bringing in efficiency and removing all fossil fuels instead of selling their so-called carbon-free electricity down south. But they can sell it down here much more than they can sell it to the ratepayers in Quebec. So given they have a $45 million, billion dollar debt up there, that might be why they prefer to sell down here. And so these various transmission lines that are all poised to be built, although none of them have been built, I'm sure one of them will be built, I don't know which one will be built, but certainly this promotion, you know, with meeting the Paris agreements, the different cities that are looking at clean energy and what is clean energy, different state standards, on a local level, if we could just address and educate our electeds, our towns, our cities, our states into understanding exactly what kind of power this is and promoting local efficiency, conservation, <coughs> small renewable projects locally and bringing in unions to support the jobs here would certainly help the campaigns to not have these imports. And so the local organizing here is very, very important and strategic in order to prevent um, what would be the building of these transmission systems from large dams. I'd like to invite people to A, get some more food and come up and talk with, with, with our two guests, even more with your questions. And if you'd like follow-up information and what we can do, make sure that you sign in with the, the, the clipboards back there so that we can keep abreast of what's going on and how we can do more down here. Yes. But thanks for our two guests. Thank you.